and we're live. Um, so <laughs> we are going to be discussing the Italian Renaissance. It's going to be different than that there, so you don't have to like double look at me. It's bad enough you have to look at me once. Oh, there we go. Um, okay. Uh, so we're going to be discussing the Italian Renaissance today. Today and tomorrow we'll just be discussing both the Italian and Northern. Uh, but today we'll just be discussing Italian and into tomorrow as well. Um, now there's not a ton to write down on this lecture. I'll make sure you know what you need to write down when you need to. Um, mostly we're looking at pretty pictures and figuring out what Renaissance art is. Okay. Um, it's actually one of the things that I pride myself most on. When I started this class, I knew almost nothing about art. Uh, and it's something that I consider a strength of mine now. So um, I look forward to sharing that with you. So this is the Italy that we're talking about. It's divided into a whole bunch of little city states. There is no Italy. There is an Italian city state of Venice, of course, a lot, and all these different ones, so eight new states. Um, I like starting out with this quote because I think it just kind of sets the scene for us. It's from a really awesome, amazing movie called The Third Man, the Cold War spy movie. In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed. But they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. Now, don't get me wrong, the cuckoo clock is pretty cool. But really not on par with our Michelangelo's and da Vinci's and all of our other new materials. So, um, to make this make sense, I just want to remind you what medieval paintings looked like. We looked at this briefly about a week ago. We talked about how the paintings weren't meant to look realistic. They were meant to depict ideas. The statues were long and lean and usually on a column, not freestanding. So this is just to remind you of that. These are a couple of the paintings that we looked at. If we look at a Renaissance painting, that has a whole bunch of ideas added into it, it looks a lot different. It looks realistic. We put them side by side, the difference is very apparent. The medieval one doesn't look right. Like, where is the viewer looking from? Are they straight on these people? Are they slightly above these people? Why are these people so much smaller than those people? The Renaissance painting on our left looks like you could reach into it. It has an illusion of depth. So this is going to be what we are going to create. Now, I have this written to the side. I want to just make sure you have this. It's not on a slide, per se. I want to talk about why the Renaissance happened in Italy first. Why did it start in Italy? So you can put this wherever you want. The first and most important factor for why Italy first was because they had wealth. The northern Italian city-states were big merchants. They had money. They could afford spending money on art. Connected to that is patrons. Patrons are people who pay for art. Because they had money, that was one of the things they spent their money on. Connected to that idea of patrons is the politics of Italy. I said just a minute ago, there was no Italy, there was all these different city-states. And those city-states competed with each other. Who's the best city-state? What's the most glorious city-state? The patrons wanted to glorify their city-state, make it look better. Florence is better than Venice. Venice is better than Milan. Yeah? Wait, weren't the city-states fighting? For sure. And there's many different reasons why they fight. There's all kinds of different factions. If you want to know a lot, there's like the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. Like, what do these names come from? Um, there's factors that support the Holy Roman Emperor, that support the Pope, that support Spain, that support France. It's a mess. You'll read a little bit about it in your reading. Well, what do you want to know? And the last part I want to bring up, which is something that I think is important not to overlook. First of all, what does Renaissance mean again? Rebirth. It's the rebirth of what? The classics. The classical era is when? Greco Roman. And where is Italy? Rome is there, right? Like they're literally walking on the stuff. Like some guy's walking along, he's like, ah, I wish I had some inspiration for some better art. Oh, what's this? And he like kicks his bolt on a statue. 
They're surrounded by the Colosseum. Pantheon. Have any of you been to Rome? Anybody in here? It's wild. Like, I knew there was a lot of ancient ruins in Rome, but literally you can't walk, like, more than a block without walking into something that's 2,000 years old. Like, it's everywhere. So that's the why Italy first. So what does the Renaissance look like? Let's just talk about some of the themes, some of the techniques that they use. It's a revival of the classics, as we said. They're bringing back these classical styles. Now, part of that, we're going to see some paintings and some uh, statues be idealized and some be realistic. So first of all, make sure we know the difference between idealized and realistic. Sorry. Can you do this with like the back slideshow? We did like a mini version. Uh, idealized means like a perfect form. Yeah, like rib, six pack, everything realistic just looks realistic. I always like to think that an idealized statue would be even look a little different than a realistic one. Politics, too. Uh, but then the question is how bold? Like, why are they bold? Does anybody have a ballpark figure of how long Greco Roman times was? It's classical times from the beginning of Greece to the end of Rome? Give or take 1,200, 1,200 in there. Do you think artistic styles remain static for that thousand years? No. Sometimes realistic was in fashion, sometimes idealized was in fashion. Fashion. And so if we're reviving the classics, they're going to revive both. We're also going to see realism. They're trying to make things look realistic, unlike in the Middle Ages. Realistic poses, emotion, feeling. Thematically, we're also going to see um, religious themes, a lot of religious themes. The vast majority of paintings are, in fact, religious. But we're also going to see everyday life. What are people doing? We're going to have a focus on the individual, again, very unlike the Middle Ages. We're going to have portraits, we're going to see individuals portraying themselves. As far as just what it looks like, it's brighter. There's new oil paints that were developed. The paintings are going to pop more. And then also this use of perspective, creating the illusion of depth, making something look three-dimensional. Right. But before we look at Renaissance paintings, I want to look at actual classical works. So the next three images we're going to look at, the next three statues we're going to look at, are from classical times, from Greco-Roman times. They also all happen to be in the Vatican Museum, so folks like to still acquire art in the end collection. Okay? So this is the Apollo Belvedere. All right, this is a classical statue. It's a Greek, or it's a Roman copy of a Greek original. Greek original was made in 300 BC. They found it in Italy in the 15th century, in the 1400s. I want you to look at that face. Circle that face. It's a good face. It's one of my favorites. Next is the Leo Kuhn. Are you guys familiar with the story of the Trojan horse? This is the dude, the Trojan dude, who told them not to take the horse. Beware the Greeks, even when they're bearing him. Still gets by the second. And then the gods sent serpents to smite him. This is when the gods are smiting him. I gotta tell you, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the way the artist is making it anyway. Um, I want to tell a story about this statue. So, this is about the actual statue. When they found this statue in 1506, it didn't have an arm. You can kind of see how there's a crack there. The arm wasn't there. The pieces were missing. So they had a competition. Renaissance was all about competitions. Who was the best individual? They had a competition. The artists to make an arm that would attach to the Leo Kuhn. And all kinds of different uh, sculptors submitted their arms. One pretty young, unknown sculptor named Michelangelo submitted an arm that was bent back, rearing in terror. 
the judges of the competition were like, that's not what's happening. The winning arm was actually outstretched as if it was fighting the serpent. Michelangelo looks like, that's malarkey. Look at the man's face. He's not fighting. He's resigned to his fate. That's not what the judges want. So the arm that won, they attached. They're like 15, 15. They stuck it on there. That arm was out there for 400 plus years. Then in the mid-1970s, some Italian is plowing his field. He says, okay, I think he's going to be going to be going And he hits something. He's like, what's that? And so he picks it up, and it's an arm. And he's like, Santa Maria, hold this in. And he's like, it's not going to say. And so they bring it to a museum, and they're like, what kind of stuff is this? They run all kinds of tests at it. They think it's from the 1500s. And one of the tests they bring it up to, this is one of my favorite stories, is a marble sommelier. Does anybody know what a sommelier is? You heard that term before for a wine. Yeah, so only a wine sommelier is somebody who takes wine and they might take a sip of wine and be like, oh, I see you. I think I'm getting some cherry in the boat. Right? Sommelier is somebody with very sensitive taste. This is a marble sommelier. They brought somebody in. They gave him the arm. The marble sommelier was like, lift the arm. Then got up on a little stool, climbed up, licked the stump. And somehow could tell it was from the same quarry. And so they took off the that arm and put on this arm that identically matches Michelangelo's design that he suggested for the competition. I think it's just the way it's photographed here. Yeah. Yeah, it's still pretty ripped. It's actually on display also in the Magic Museum. The arm's just sitting there. It's like his arm was attached for 400 years. And we brought our hair. Hey, remember that arm? Circle that arm. What's good on? That's hard, but not dab. Yeah, I was like, dab, buddy. <laughs> arm! Uh, the next classical statue I want to look at is the Belvedere Torso. What's that? Oh. Uh, it was one of the archaeological digs that they did, so they just kind of made that piece of art. Not the dig, I shouldn't say that, like somebody who's funding the digs. Um, so it doesn't look like much. We're like, oh great, there's like a broken statue. What is that? But contrast this with the medieval statues that we saw that were long and lean and slender and attached to columns. Artists looked at this and they were like, oh, that's not what that is. It's dynamic, it's moving. You can see the motion in the stone. Michelangelo, Leonardo, they did dozens of sketches of this thing in all different lights, in all different angles. This amazed them. They just stared at it for hours. Actually, it's really cool in the Vatican Museum, too. It's right under a portico, so like the light shines down on it. It's like right in the middle, and it's just like, oh. But if you don't know what it is, people just kind of walk past it, and they're like, what's this broken thing? Uh, it was pretty cool. Remember that torso? This is all they felt. Yeah. 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 The next part we're going to talk about is I just want to make sure you understand that the Renaissance didn't happen overnight. It's not like the end of the Hundred Years' War happened, and then the next day, like, four Italian dudes woke up and were like, oh, let's have a Renaissance, and they started painting this. And I like showing this one by Giotto from the early 1300s because it shows a transition to the Renaissance. So here we have a picture of Mary and baby Jesus. And it looks like a cross between medieval and Renaissance. There's Mary. There's some shadowing on her face, on her dress, but uh, she looks kind of vanished, doesn't she? And baby Jesus doesn't really look like a baby. He just looks kind of like a mini person. It's like maybe a smaller person. And their halos are very pronounced. But there's still some depth. There's people in the foreground. There's people in the background. It looks more realistic than our medieval painting, but not quite Renaissance. Let's jump ahead a century and a half. 
And here is a realistic looking painting of Mary and baby Jay. This is a tired young mother with her pudgy, cranky baby who didn't sleep last night and they're both pissed about. The halos are very faded, so faint they're almost not there. He's got curls. And some for some reason receding hairline. That's something to agree with the other one. He's a special. Yeah. Um, but the other part I like to know about this is Mary is wearing Renaissance garb. And she's under a Renaissance dome. So it's bringing it into their own time. Still do. They call her Madonna. That's just the Italian version of Mary. Yes. I was going to do a Madonna song, but then I wondered if there was a recording or two. I don't remember Madonna songs that are not appropriate. So, uh, Madonna and Child was a very common Renaissance theme, but again, you can see all of these are in Renaissance garb. All of these are set in the Tuscan countryside, in the Italian countryside. Went to eight years of Catholic school. I don't remember Jesus visiting Italy. Why is Jesus visiting that? Isn't it because Healthy. That's what it is. I'm actually reading a book right now called Fat, a history, uh, a cultural history of the stuff of life. And it's studying how we perceive fat, how it changes throughout time. Good connection. Uh, so this is Mary with her mom, St. Anne. This is Mary with his cousin, John. And I look at this painting, I just, I, it's not true in some of the artists, but, but I always picture baby Jesus being like, Mom, I don't need the Bible, I'm in. You're the one who is. I'm the star. Um, but, Why is one being clothed and the other not? Because John the Baptist didn't pick John the Baptist. He was a, a static. He always he lived in the woods. It's just to symbolize John the Baptist. Um, this is one of my favorite Renaissance paintings. I like to use this to introduce because it brings a lot of things in. Uh, if you're familiar with the story, this is when baby Jesus was born and the three wise guys came to visit him and give him mom gifts. Okay? Um, except, again, eight years of Catholic school, I don't recall that Jesus was born in the ruins of Rome. So they're bringing it into their time, making it look classical. Also, the guys who, paint, who paid for the painting, the Medici's, requested to be in the painting to show their importance that they were at the birth of Christ. So here's two Renaissance bankers at the birth of Christ. Who knew? And then my favorite part is here on this side is Botticelli. He's the artist of the painting. And he's kind of looking out at you and he's like, what? If they can be in it, so can I. I painted it. So for me, this shows the importance of the patrons. But it also shows the importance of the individual. Botticelli thought himself important enough to be there too. Yes. Not that I know of this one. Uh, this is an early Renaissance painting. Uh, the first nude since classical times. The Middle Ages, you would never depict a person as naked. You'd be tried for heresy and sentenced to death. This is when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden for eating the holy pomegranate. Wasn't an acid, by the way. There's no acids in the ancient world. Wait, weren't the last couple of paintings they preceded that? So the third one? Yeah, those. Yeah, these are Renaissance. This one just happens to be earlier. Oh, okay. And also, and this is going to sound really weird, and I don't really watch this on video, but it's considered generally speaking okay to paint naked babies, but not painting adults. Kind of like you post a picture of a naked baby, like, look at those people's back, this is okay, but if you do it any older, you get arrested. <laughs> The other part, I want you to take a second and look at Eve here. She's an ugly bag. Right? That's actually on purpose. There's a theory floating, you don't need to write this down, this is just free. Okay? There's this theory floating around during Renaissance time that it wasn't actually years that aged you, it was sin. Sin is what aged you. As you sin more, you age. And so Eve, after sinning, aged. That's why she's so old and ugly. I actually believe in that theory. Because I'm 475 years old. Uh, no, <laughs> actually, I'm only three. Uh, so, anyway, uh, we'll get back to that. Like, the red. 
that's the angel Gabriel kicking him out. That's God's like lifeguard. Out of the pool, no running. Wait, Adam was But that he was not the root of sin. He was the one who gave him the pomegranate. It was her fault. So it's partially why the Catholic Church is so misogynistic. The arch? Yeah, it's a I think that's probably just the painting. I don't know for sure. Uh, I just want to give you a quick look at perspective here, just a real simple drawing so you understand how perspective works. Um, and one of the things I learned when I first started studying this is that the vanishing point doesn't actually need to be on the painting. If you wish to create an off kilter view, it can be off the painting, which I think is kind of cool. Um, this is a great painting from one of our Ninja Turtles, Raphael, The Marriage of Virgin, and it shows perspective really well. Um, so here's Mary and Joseph getting married. Once again, eight years of Catholic school. I don't recall that they had a destination wedding in Florence, which is where this is set right now. Um, and you can still visit that building, by the way. That's the baptistry that you would visit that again in the set. But this is a great example of perspective because you have the people in the foreground, you have the people in the midground, people in the background all getting smaller. And you can look straight through the front and back baptistry doors and see the Tuscan sunset right there. Off topic, with spring break, you should plan a trip to all of the HBO classes that are this year. You make an assumption that on my spring break I want to hang out with teenagers more. Love it. Yeah. It would get more people to go to class. We'll talk about that at a different time. <laughs> the idea of traveling for teenagers terrifies me. The time and sales Okay. Well, that's different. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, like I said, the Renaissance was a process. It didn't just happen overnight. But if for some reason you felt the need to pick a moment, to pick a single word that we say the Renaissance started here, Ghiberti's Gates of Paradise would be the spot you could pick. They had a big contest to see who would design the gates. This is for the baptistry, the one I just showed you. They're like, we want new gates for the back of the baptistry. Gilberti won the contest. These things are each about two feet tall, two and a half feet tall. They are microscopic, not microscopic in terms of life. They're millimeter, millimeters thick, but the detail is just amazing. He won the prize and then spent the next 12 years designing these doors. They liked them so much, they were like, we're not putting them on the back door, we're putting them on the front door. Well, we designed the back door for us now, too, and he's like, man, he took another 15 years. They like those even more. They took the ones that he built for the back and put to the front. They put those to the back and put the second ones on the front. There's recreations of them on the baptistry still today. You can stand like right up next to them. It's really cool. The original panels, though, are in a museum that's right across the street, and it's totally worth going to see them. See just the amazing, intricate detail on this sublimely thin gold. Pretty cool. Um, the Birth of Venus. This is another Botticelli. Uh, this brings up another theme of the revival of the classics. This is a pagan theme. This is the birth of the goddess of love. She was born in a seashell or sea foam or something. I forget. A catch. I don't know if you noticed, but she's also naked. And she, that is the human form, glorifying the human form and everything about it. But she's the goddess, yes, but this is her in her human form. Well, but she's also healthy. She's got like some string down. Uh, the Venus of Urbino, this is important just for the artist Tishun. Uh, Tishun is considered the first modernist painting, the first modern painter, uh, because he painted on canvas rather than wood panel. There's a lot of mysterious things in this painting. Nobody knows who the little girl in the background is or what she's doing exactly in the chest. Uh, this painting is going to inspire several other paintings, one of which we'll look at in like January. So make sure you remember. Um, I want to take a look at the School of Athens by Raphael. 
if we had to point to one painting that I think is the quintessential Renaissance painting that sums up the Renaissance, I say it's the School of Athens. Okay? The School of Athens has everything. It's got classical arches and domes in here. It has some classical figures. This is Plato, the ancient philosopher. He's pointing skyward because philosophers are concerned with lofty ideas. His face, by the way, Raphael painted him as Leonardo da Vinci, the individual. Next to him is Plato, uh, excuse me, it's Aristotle, the scientist of the classical era. His hand is pointed down, facing down. The scientists are concerned with earthly matter. Everybody on this side of the painting is a scientist, an architect, mathematicians. Everybody on this side is philosophers and artists. The guy in the center leaning on a block of marble is actually Michelangelo. Raphael was like, this dude's so impressive, he deserves to be in that kind of painting. There's Leo. This is Euclid. He invented geometry. I know you guys all love him. Socrates yelling at people. Uh, but here's my favorite thing that I want to tell you about this story. This is the best picture of the School of Athens I've ever found. Because it looks like the School of Athens as it actually is. A lot of times when you look up pictures, they brighten them up. So they look like they should have before. This is what it actually looks like. I've seriously been using this picture for over 20 years when I teach it. But I never knew what that was. I could never figure out what that was. Sometimes every once in a while a kid would ask and I'd be like, I don't know what that is. Hey. And then finally we got the opportunity to go to Rome. This is in the Vatican Museum. They stand right on the wall of the Vatican Museum. First time we went there, there's so much to look at. We didn't actually get to the room that has a school of Athens. I was so disappointed. I'm like, when am I ever going to go back? We had the great opportunity, like four years later, to go back. So we went back and I'm like, we're going to see the school of Athens. So you get the little map of the Vatican Museum and you're going through all these corridors and all these tiny rooms. And you're peeling around and you go there and you get to the room that's the School of Athens and you walk in the room and you look up and it's not the School of Athens. You're like, what the hell? <laughs> the painting on the other wall is not the School of Athens, but it's the painting on this wall that you walk in. So you walk in and walk in a little bit, right through the crowds, and you look up and there's the School of Athens. I'm looking at it like, this is amazing. Like, look at this upset. I just my life. I'm like, this is incredible. And then I look at it and I'm like, wait a second. It's the door. My wife's like, what are you talking about? Look, it's the door. And like other tourists are like, what the hell wrong with that American wife is standing at the door? Like, What's going on? <laughs> this, in this photograph that I have, that's the door that you walk in the room to see this painting. <laughs> like you walk in right here, you're like, <laughs> like you walk in, that's the door. And so I finally found it out after all those years. That's why you travel to discover things like that that you never get to discover unless you actually go to the land. Wait, so is that like actually a painting? Or? No, this is it's, this is the wall, and that's the door. Like this oh, is the oh, room oh, that oh, it's oh, in. Why yeah. Why does the door look like it's not? It does. Uh, it's just black. It would probably black it out for the photographic if I guess it would turn over or something. But yeah. So anyway, that's the school of Athens. Um, next, I'm going to talk about our next Ninja Turtle, Leonardo da Vinci. I think just the fact that his name is da Vinci is significant. He doesn't have a last name. Vinci's his town. He's Leonardo da Vinci. He likes saying Kevin of Partridge. What that means is he didn't have a father. He didn't have a family lineage. Any time before this, he would have amounted to probably not much. But this is the Renaissance, and the individual is important. If you have ambition and talent, you can rise up. He was what we call a renaissance man. And when I say man, I think man is a manifestation of a human being, not man is a man. He was a renaissance man, which means he was really good at a lot of things. He was a scientist. He studied anatomy, botany, physics. Even though none of those words existed for what he was studying at the time, he did. He was an inventor and an engineer. In fact, that's how he paid the bills. He would design siege weapons and siege defenses for towns. Italy was in constant warfare. Business was always well. And also on the side, he did a little painting. He was an artist. Is this part from baby painter or from design instructor? 
I have no idea what any of those words are. Oh, you got in church. I don't know the fucking thing. They went back in time. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Did they ever use the Da Vinci code? No, but I think the Mythbusters tried to. I well, Da Vinci code is totally unrelated. It's not history at all. Okay. So that's terrible. Uh, he kept a notebook where he did a lot of his designs. That's what his bitchy tank was. He actually <laughs> wrote it in mirror image. His left hand and he wrote it in mirror image so nobody could steal his ideas. The Virtue Man, that's showing the perfect proportions of a human being. I got one up there. Somebody sent it him. Uh, <laughs> so let's take a look at the Mona Lisa. The most famous image in the world, probably. Yeah, she's a lady. All apologies to Miss Mona Lisa, she was a nobody. So why is this important? She's getting a portrait of her as what? An individual. This isn't a queen or an empress. It's the wife of a moderate noble. How many of you been to the room? Henry? Alright, both of you have been to Luke. So here's the scene when you get to Luke. When you have to go to Luke, you go to Paris. Alright, you go in, it's a huge museum, it's overwhelmingly large. You walk in and you go through and you look at all these amazing works of art. And then you finally get to the room that's the Mona Lisa. It's super crowded. People are pushing and jostling jostling and all kinds of stuff. And then there's, and there's like guides and guards saying, no pictures, no pictures, and people are taking pictures. And there's a big wall at the end of the room that goes all the way up to the ceiling. And you finally push your way up there and you get to the front. And what's the first thing that strikes you about the Mona Lisa? It's this big. The one I have up there is larger than the original. I remember getting to the front and being like, Why do they have the mini out today? Where's the real one? They actually carried it around for years. They carried it in the back and they did things to make changes. Next, Leo, I want to talk about just real quick here. It's the Last Supper. This one's huge. This one's the size of the, of the chalkboard there. Um, the reason I think this one is cool is because when the people at the town of Turin commissioned Leonardo to do a painting of the Last Supper, he took a different angle. First of all, he took the moment Jesus told his 12 best friends that one of them betrayed him. And all of them were like, oh, really mad and shot. One of them was thinking. But what Michelangelo did is he invented a new paint and a new plaster. And he's like, this is going to last a thousand years. It'll be wonderful. Within a couple years, it started falling apart. People turned in were pretty pissed. But to Da Vinci, it was just an experiment. It was just science. He tried something that didn't work. It's under glass now, temperature controls, humidity controls, everything to try to preserve it. Nope, they're all dudes. Although that's actually part of the Fictional book, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about Mike Michael. We'll just start him and then we'll uh, we'll get to the rest of him tomorrow. Okay. Michael Angelo is the preeminent sculptor of the Renaissance, maybe one of the greatest sculptors in human history. My favorite work of his, I have two. We'll look at both of them, but the one that comes to my mind first is the Pieta. This is in St. Peter's Basilica, in the heart of the Catholic Church. Um, it's the moment Jesus is handed her, excuse me, Mary is handed her dead son after he's come down off the cross. This is just incredibly striking work. Um, you don't have to be Christian, you don't have to be religious to appreciate the beauty of this thing. It seems to almost emanate its own life. It's incredible. It's also huge. It's estimated that if, they, if Mary stood up, if you could stand her frame up, she'd be like six stories. Okay. Uh, Michelangelo entered this in a contest, and when they asked who did this one, he was only 25 years old. The guys who were judging the contest were like, there's no way a 25-year-old made something this incredible. You must be lying. He was so pissed that during the night, he snuck in and carved his name on Mary's sash right there. And then he was so embarrassed that he did that, he never signed another one of his works, of his works to get the rest of his life. But I want to put one thing out here. I want you to look at Mary. 
That's the shadow. Look at Mary. Does she look old enough to have a 30 year old son? Because she has a difference because she believes the mother of God is not sin. That's what she believes in God. It's really hard to get a good photograph of it because it's behind glass. The late 70s, some nut job went up to it, took a hammer to it, and knocked a couple of pieces off. So you always get like a reflection of the glass. <laughs> you know what? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, fashion of the times, but I don't have a better answer for that. It's also the sign like a young woman would have her hair covered. Okay, a uh, quick change of setting here, but we're going to pick up right where we left off after the Pieta. So we're still on Michelangelo. Um, and we're going to look at his other most famous skate painting and maybe one of the greatest, or sculpture, excuse me, one of the greatest ones ever. And this is the David. Um, so the David is um, a depiction of the biblical, the Old Testament hero David of David and Goliath, if you've heard of him. Um, and he is um, about to attack, about to take on the giant. And David was a very common theme for both medieval and Renaissance artists. But almost always they depicted David after he had slain the giant. He's got the giant's head in his hand or he's standing on his head. But here, this is the moment David sees his destiny. He sees Goliath coming over the hill. He has a sling over his shoulder, and he's about to seize his destiny. Now, that's key because this statue was made for the town of Florence. The Medici's paid for it. They commissioned it. And Florence felt like it was on the verge of seizing its destiny to become the greatest Italian city-state. And so this is a poignant statue. It's also just incredible. It's 17 feet tall. Um, without counting the base. It's huge. It's so incredibly detailed. Um, you see the veins. It's a single piece of marble. It's freestanding. Um, the one part I do want to point out that's pretty interesting is his head is actually slightly disproportional. It's actually kind of elongated. And the idea was that it was going to be put atop the Medici Palace. Um, which was this three-story tall building in Florence. But it was so big, they could never get it up there. Um, and so th that way the head would look in proportion as you were looking down from three stories and the 17 feet of the statue. But they could never get it up there, so it just stayed on the ground for centuries. Um, and eventually they just built this museum around it. Uh, it's called the Academia. It's actually a super cool museum. Uh, and there's not much else to see in this museum um, besides the David, which is one of the reasons why you want to get a museum pass when you go visit Italy, um, because you can cut all the lines. You don't have to wait in line like an hour and a half just to see the David. But I do want to point out one other thing. As you're walking down the hallway to get to the David, there's blocks of marble alongside of you. And they're not like even set behind rope or anything. They're just kind of laying out. They're called the prisoners. And they're all incomplete sculptures, different pieces, parts are chipped away. And these are statues that Michelangelo started, but never completed. So like there's one that you can almost see somebody coming out. You have the start of a face and an arm coming out. But what's cool is you can go up and you can touch them, or at least 20 years ago you could. Um, and it's just so neat because you think to yourself, like, Michelangelo was here. He was chiseling away at some point. Uh, so it's just pretty cool. The next Michelangelo that I want to talk about, uh, Michelangelo was visiting Rome one time and the Pope heard he was in town. Pope summoned Michelangelo and was like, hey, Michelangelo, I've got this little chapel that I want you to paint. And Michelangelo was like, hey, I'm not really a painter. I'm kind of more of a sculptor, you know, Popey? And the Pope was like, ah, hey, you paint this chapel or you won't leave Rome alive. And Michelangelo was like, ah, hey, Bruno, when do I start? And so this is the Sistine Chapel before Michelangelo did his work. And this is the Sistine Chapel after. This is looking straight up at the ceiling. And this is looking at the back altar piece. So we're going to look at a few different paintings here. So along the ceiling are frescoes. These are paintings of biblical stories. Um, and they tell a bunch of different stories. This is the creation. This is the moment 
God is giving life to Adam. Uh, some people think this is just before the moment God gives life to Adam because he's not touching him. I actually believe this is the moment because the human could never touch the divine. So it's like the spark of life is going to jump between. This one is the fall from grace. This is when Adam and Eve eat the pomegranate from the serpent and then they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. It looks a lot like one of the other ones, the first nude that we looked at. But again, look at how ugly they are. Age is what sins them. Um, this is the last judgment. This is when Jesus is sitting in judgment at the end of the world, judging the living and the dead. Um, they're deciding who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And this one just has all kinds of amazing details. This one here is a, a early century saint who was actually skinned alive. But Michelangelo put his face on this character because he thought this job was just killing him. He hated this job. He was lying on his back doing these frescoes and everything, and he just hated it. Um, right here is a guy who obviously um, is regretting his life choices as he's being pulled down uh, into the depths of hell. Uh, this is the book of the judged. This is the book of those who are saved. And this is the book of those who are damned. Um, and you can see how much bigger the book of the damned is. This is one of my favorite stories right here. Um, this is actually a cardinal, a high-ranking church official, and he didn't like Michelangelo's work. He saw the Sistine Chapel being done, and he was told the Pope, he's like, this is terrible, all these naked people, it looks like pagan themes, like, this is awful. And the Pope told Michelangelo, and Michelangelo was so ticked that he put that cardinal's face on one of the minions of Satan. Um, so he's depicted as this devil, and um, when the cardinal complained to the Pope, uh, the Pope supposedly said, uh, I'm sorry, my son, it's only up to God who gets to judge the living and the dead. Um, let's take a quick tour of the Vatican, just, or excuse me, the Sistine Chapel. Just look around. Um, you can see there's the frescoes and the ceiling um, as you buzz in closer. Um, I want to look at this one just real quick. This is the flood. This was the first one that Michelangelo did. And you see it's real small. It's very detailed, all kinds of intricate people. You can hardly see it from the floor, what it is. It's the first one he did, the first fresco he did, and he hated it. He was like, this is terrible. You can't see it. So he hired all new assistants, and you'll see after that they get a lot bigger, a lot more simple. There's creation of man. Um this one is interesting. Oh, it's coming in kind of blurry now. Can we see it better? Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Nope, cancel. Um, so I don't know if you can see, this is when God creates the sun and then the moon. That's God's bare butt right there. And when you ask a lot of historians, why is that there? Some people are just like, it's not. You're like, it's right there, I can see it. They're like, nope. But then... I want to zoom in here. I will just go back to this. I want to zoom back here on Jesus. So here's Jesus, judging the living and the dead. Renaissance art. I want you to look at that face. It's a good face. Look at that arm. It's a good arm. Look at that torso twisting. Michelangelo was literally recreating the classics. He was copying the classics. When we talk about Renaissance art being a rebirth of the classics, here is the inspiration. I just think that's kind of cool. Um, very quickly, you don't need to know this. This is far more detailed than is necessary, but I found this really interesting from a book called The Annotated Mona Lisa uh, by Dr. Carol Strickland. She calls it the four R's of Renaissance architecture, Rome, rules, reason, and arithmetic. Um, and so everything we see in the Renaissance follows these ideas. Uh, and I just think that's kind of a neat idea. Those of you who like architecture, engineering, uh, might find that interesting. Um, St. Peter's Basilica, uh, inside and outside, is a great example of Renaissance art, or Renaissance architecture, excuse me. You have the large dome. Um, and everything is purposeful. By the way, when you visit St. Peter's Basilica, you get a tour of the Basilica, the church itself. This is like the heart of the Roman Catholic Church. And after the tour, you have a, a choice whether to go down to the crypts and see the tombs of a bunch of dead popes or up to the roof um, and look over the city. 
the tombs are fine, they're cool, but it's just a bunch of tombs. It's not like you see bodies or anything like that. It is nice and cool, though, and Rome gets really hot. But the shot up at the top, sorry. So this shot is what you get to see as you're looking if you decide to go up. Um, and this is uh, St. Michael's Square, um, the Piazza, and it's actually shaped like a keyhole, like the, like an old keyhole, like a skeleton key kind of thing. Um, and the idea was that St. Peter, uh, Jesus gave him the keys to the church. He was the rock on which he built his church. Um, and the papal symbol is actually two keys crossed. Um, so St. Michael's Square is made to look like that keyhole. Um, I want to briefly talk about Renaissance literature. Um, you read some Petrarch. Um, Petrarch is such an interesting dude. I know you read him and you didn't like him. We call him the father of humanism. Um, he's kind of our transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Um, he was trained, he was raised as a, as a Middle Ages monk, um, as a medieval monk, excuse me. Um, but he's starting to read these classics and he's just torn and he's like, oh, Cicero, you're the coolest guy ever, but you were a pagan and were born before knowing the blessings of Christ, so you must be evil and burning in hell, but you're awesome. And so he is this transition for us from the Middle Ages, from scholasticism uh, to humanism. Um, he is challenging scholasticism. Um, we'll skip uh, Boccaccio. Don't worry about him right now. Sorry, apologies. Um, next bit of Italian Renaissance literature I want to talk about is The Prince. Uh, Machiavelli. So everybody, Machiavelli. Uh, Machiavelli wrote a book, The Prince. Uh, it was a handbook for leaders on how to gain rule. Italy is in, in divided into all these battling city-states. And Machiavelli's writing this book. It's actually written as a job interview. He's writing it to hope to be an advisor to, to a prince um, on how to gain power. Um, and it's a new style of writing, this handbook. Um, if it was in Barnes & Noble today, it would be in the how-to section. It's how to how to uh, gain a state for dummies. Um, and so this is all about the individual. Uh, he said, is it better to be feared or loved? And his answer to that question was, it's better to be feared because people fall out of love with you, but they don't fall out of fear of you. But he said, better not be feared so much that you're hated because if you're hated, people will overcome their fear. Uh, he also said it's important to be clever like a fox and strong like a lion. Sometimes you have to be clever enough to avoid a trap. Sometimes you have to be strong enough just to get yourself out of it. And that's Prince. <laughs> um, the last bit of Italian Renaissance literature I want to talk about is uh, Dante, the Divine Comedy. It's actually three books. He wrote three books, uh, Paradiso, Purgatorio, Purgatorio, Paradise, Purgatory, and then Hell, the Inferno. Um, that's the Divine Comedy altogether. Everybody only ever reads the uh, Inferno because the other two are really boring. But what this one does is a couple things. Is it tells us Renaissance values. It tells us what is important to Italians in the Renaissance. Because what he does is it's a story of Dante descending down into hell. And each layer is a greater punishment. And each layer is a greater sin. So the indifferent, the lustful, the gluttonous, these are just the kind of, these are this kind of not terrible sins, but kind of sins. But then as you get deeper and deeper into hell, the very bottom of hell, the deepest pit of hell is saved for traitors, those who get it, go against their own. It might interest you that Dante wrote this book while he was in exile because his town of Florence was in a civil war and the faction that he was in got defeated and got kicked out. The Guelphs defeated the Ghibellines and he got kicked out, never to return to his beloved Florence again. And he felt like he was betrayed. And so that shows the values of the Italian Italians during the Renaissance. The other part that's worthwhile noting here, this book was so significant and influential that the dialect he wrote it in, he wrote it in the Florentine dialect of Italian. There was numerous different dialects. That dialect of Florence becomes Italian. That becomes the standard Italian that is still standard Italian today. 
Um, so kind of interesting there. All right, and now we're going to go into the Northern Renaissance here, and this is much shorter than the Italian Renaissance, so don't stress. The Northern Renaissance is basically everything that's not the Italian Renaissance, okay? So we're going to be talking France, Holy Roman Empire, England, then inconveniently Spain because it's not the Italian Renaissance. I know it's not North, but it's not Italian. We're actually not going to talk about Spain much, so we're mostly here, okay? We'll primarily be here. So what did the Northern Renaissance look like? Um, it was much more religious and much more conservative than the Italian Renaissance. And by conservative, I mean much fewer naked people, okay? Um, we're also going to see a lot more domestic scenes, common, everyday scenes. Um, we're going to see everyday life and commoners. It's much more realistic and less idealized than the Italian. You're not going to see David just absolutely ripped like that. You're also not going to see um, the birth of Venus. You're going to see no um, classics like that. Um, because that would be too pagan to go along with Christian humanism. Um, I know that word was in your reading, that idea of trying to bring humanist ideas and Christianity into consort, into working together. So this idea of Christian humanism really is emphasized in the Northern Renaissance. Um, Technique-wise, it's much more on woodcuts and paintings on wood panels. Um, because they have more trees up there than they do in Italy. It's almost like geography is your destiny or something. I don't know. And then generally speaking, most Italian Renaissance ideas are incorporated. Ideas of perspective, um, all those kind of different ideas, but they're adopted more slowly and more conservatively than they are in Italy. Uh, so we're going to look at a few artists and some of their works. Uh, the first guy we're going to look at is Albrecht Dwyer. Um, he is an artist, and these are self-portraits. Like right there, that should tell you the importance of the individual. And here he puts his initials, and here he signs his name, and even puts a little inscription. And the inscription basically says, like, Albrecht Dwyer, the most awesome, awesome, whoever, awesome. And so he's giving himself this importance. In this picture, he's depicted as an Italian nobleman. Now, he wasn't at all. He was a German painter, but he's putting on this elegant pose and these elegant clothes. He's vindicating the role of the artist, the status of the artist as important here. Um, and so this idea of the individual. Um, another painter, very famous painter of the Northern Renaissance is Peter Brugo the Elder. Um, he shows a lot of peasant scenes, everyday life. Um, this is the hunters in the snow. They're coming back from a hunt, fairly unsuccessful. Um, I love this one because this just looks cold. Like you see the people using the blast furnace here, trying to heat up to do metal work. People ice skating and playing on the pond. Somebody carrying their fuel for their fire. Um, just a lot going on in depth and perspective and the birds. Just feels cold to me. Um, this is just a peasant scene. This is just a peasant square. Um, you know, this is there's a little festival going on. People are dancing. People are drinking. The church is the biggest building in the background. They're dancing. There's nothing idealized here. This just shows a scene that people would have been very familiar with. As for the little tiny people in the foreground, different art historians have different theories about that. There's not a real settled one. Just try to ignore them and move on, okay? Um, this one's called The Peasant Wedding. This is also by Peter Brugo, the Elder. Um, again, a scene that people would have been familiar with. It's in a shared town hall, a common hall, probably the church hall. They're drinking from shared, shared, drug, shared jugs of mead. They're sitting in a common benches, common table, eating a simple meal. The only guy who has his own chair is the father of the bride. And he's looking rather grumpy because he's paying for all this. Um, so again, everyday life, not idealized. Um, to show the religious component of the Northern Renaissance, the Christian aspect, I want to bring in a painter by the name of Hieronymus Bosch. Um, Bosch was very religious, and he was depicting religious scenes. Uh, this one is the seven deadly sins. 
Um, the seven deadly sins are the sins that Christians believe that if you commit them, you're automatically going to hell if you don't get uh, if you don't get confession. This is like a do not pass go, do not collect two hundred dollars. Um, they are pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. You don't need to know those. I'm just showing off. I'm not even really showing off. I had to check my cheat sheet there. Um, it's much easier to try to remember the seven dwarfs, right? Like dopey, sneezy, stupid. To, I don't remember what they are, whatever. Um, but the religious component. Um, another Hieronymus Bosch. This is a three-part wood panel called the Garden of Earthly Delights. And again, this shows religious components here. Um, uh, on this, you see... Um, uh, you see the fountain of life here. You see beautiful animals, a unicorn, uh, a tiny albino giraffe, because Bosch probably never saw one of those. Uh, you see God talking to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Paradise, and everything's beautiful. Um, but then here is the fall from grace. This is when it's super crowded with people and carnal desire, and it's crowded, and there's desire is man's driving force here. Um, and so this is the fall from grace. This is after we sinned and as we are sinning. There's earthly pleasures all around. I mean, that would be a sweet ride, right? All kinds of stuff. And then the last part of his panel uh, is hell. Uh, this is depiction of hell. There's a, a city in flames in the background, the torment of sinners all throughout here. There's just a lot of things going on here that are creepy and frightening and I'd prefer not to dwell on this for too long because it gets creepy. Uh, next, I want to talk about Jan van Eyck. Uh, he is of the Flemish school of the Northern Renaissance. So this is the Low Countries, Holland and Flanders, uh, modern day Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, van Eyck is famous and, uh, and unique because of his amazing detail. I mean, look at the detail on these paintings, on the trimmings, on her robe, on his robe. On the stained glass windows, the columns, the crown, the detail is just so unique and so amazing. Even the tile, the intricate designs. Um, he is in large part credited with inventing oil painting in the north, bringing it from Italy to the north. Um, another one of his that's really cool uh, is the Arnolfi wedding. Um, this is a couple that is getting married. Um, she's along with child, which was normal. They, you know, she got done knocked up, and now they're getting hitched. Um, the couple things worth noting about this: um, these are most likely, or he is most likely, a merchant. Um, the Netherlands, the the Dutch Republic, it's going to become was a rising wealthy area because of trade. And here they are showing off their wealth, their extravagant clothes. They can afford a pet. They have a gorgeous large window chandelier. And then even this mirror in the background shows their wealth, shows the, the, the consumption that they can afford. The other cool part is if you look really close at a detail of this, Van Eyck put himself in the painting. Here's the couple, the reflection of their backs, and then he is facing them here, which is just an incredible detail and I think is so cool. Uh, we're going to skip El Greco. My apologies, Greek. It's just the way it's got to be. Um, and then we're going to get to Northern Renaissance literature. We talked a little bit about Italian Renaissance, uh, Italian Renaissance literature. Now for Northern Renaissance literature. Um, the big part here um, is this is a lot of Christian humanism. Again, trying to bring the ideas of Christianity in consort with those humanist ideas. Um, one of the best examples of a Northern Renaissance author is Sir Thomas More. Uh, he wrote a book called Utopia, a very famous book. Um, and what he does in this book, Utopia is a perfect world. It's a perfect place. And he's writing this book as he's interacting with a person from Utopia. Um, the ironic part is Utopia is actually a combination of a couple Latin words, which means nowhere. Um, but in this perfect world, the visitor from Utopia describes how there's no corruption, how the government runs perfectly, how there's no religion. And what Thomas More is doing is criticizing the Catholic Church and criticizing the government for their corruption and for their worldly desires. Because in this perfect world, that doesn't happen. Um, and so it's a combination of satire, criticism here, um, in this perfect world. 
Uh, and then, of course, the most famous of our Northern Renaissance authors uh, is Big Bad Willie, is Will Shakespeare. Um, we still read him today. And I want to take a moment and just talk about why. Okay, I want you to write down two things, two reasons why we still study him. We still study him because of his understanding of the human condition. His understanding of the human condition. He got us. He understood us. He knew what made us tick. And for his contributions to the English language. So his understanding of the human condition and his contributions to the English language. We'll take both of those. We'll talk about both of those for a second. So to understand his uh, understanding of us, I want to talk about Romeo and Juliet, the balcony scene. Okay, how many of you have read Romeo and Juliet or were supposed to have read it? There's a balcony scene where these two teenagers are making out and he's not supposed to be there because their families are enemies and she's got to leave and he or she's got to go back inside and he's got to go and they keep making out and they keep on saying like good night good night and they keep kissing and saying good night good night and she's finally like a thousand times good night i gotta go so he wrote that 500 years ago i want you to fast forward to a scene in libertyville last night not you of course but your friend your friend's on the phone with their significant other. It's late at night. Okay, good night. Yeah, I gotta go. Good night. Good night. No, I don't wanna go. No, okay. I don't wanna hang up first. Okay, all right. All right, we'll hang up at the same time. Ready? One, two, three. No, you didn't hang up either. I know. Okay, I know. It's the same scene as the Romeo and Juliet balcony scene. Just centuries later, he got us. He knew what made us work, how we work. Now, for his contributions to the English language, we're going to read through something real quick here. And I mean real quick. Shakespeare contributed hundreds and hundreds of words and phrases to the English phrase, to the English language. Some of them he made up. Some of them he popularized. Some of them he changed. It would be impossible to get them all in one place. What I want you to do on this slide is as you're going through it, as I'm going through this and reading it, I want you to underline any of these that you've ever heard or heard of just to realize what a contribution Shakespeare made to our language. If you cannot understand my argument and declare it's Greek to me, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you claim to be more sinned against than sinning, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you record your salad days, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you act more in sorrow than in anger, if your wish is further to the thought, if your lost property is vanished into thin air, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you have ever refused to budge an inch or suffer from green-eyed jealousy, if you've played fast and loose, if you've been tongue-tied to tower of strength, hoodwinked or in a pickle, if you have knitted your brows, made a virtue of necessity, insisted on fair play, slept not one wing, stood on ceremony, danced attendance on your lord and master, laughed yourself into stitches, had short shrift, cold comfort, or too much of a good thing, if you've seen better days or lived in a fool's paradise, why, be that as it may, the more fool you, for it is a foregone conclusion that you are, as good luck would have it, quoting Shakespeare. If you think it is early days and clear out bag and baggage, if you think it is high time and that is the long and short of it, if you believe the game is up and the truth will out, even if it involves your own flesh and blood, if you lie low till the crack of doom because you suspect foul play, if you have your teeth set on edge at one fell swoop without rhyme or reason, then to give the devil his due, if the truth were known, for surely you have a tongue in your head, you are quoting Shakespeare. Even if you bid me good riddance and send me packing, if you wish I dead as a doornail, if you think I'm an eyesore, a laughing stock, the devil incarnate, a stony-hearted villain, bloody-minded or a blinking idiot, then by Jove, O oh Lord, tut tut, for goodness sake, what the dickens, but me no buts, it is all one to me, for you are quoting Shakespeare. And that's just a small percentage of what he has contributed, what he contributed to our English language. Now, the last guy I want to talk about here is um, Erasmus of Rotterdam. Um, Erasmus uh, was the preeminent Christian humanist. He was the leading Christian humanist. He was a Christian and he loved his church, but he knew there was problems with it. He knew it was corrupt. And so he wanted to try to fix it. So his writings are he's trying to fix it. Uh, his most famous work is In Praise of Folly. Uh, which, again, is a criticism of and a satire of the Catholic Church and just showing the hypocrisy and showing the inconsistency that the Catholic Church was. 
Um, and so he's trying to bring these humanist ideas of reason and realism and these ideas together um, with Christianity. Uh, he also was a plurif plurific writer. He wrote a lot. Um, and so uh, his works pop up a lot in College Board materials and documents. Um, I put this together. This chart is adapted from the annotated Mona Lisa, again by Dr. Strickland, just kind of showing a compare and contrast of the uh, of the two Renaissance, the Italian and Northern. Uh, and then, yeah, that's it. So thank you very much for going through this entire conversation on the Renaissance. I hope you know a little bit more about Renaissance art and literature. And uh, yeah, take it easy. Later.